All right. Well, thanks very much for the invitation uh, to speak with you all today. My name is Aaron Raymond Schneider. I'm an otologist and neurootologist at uh, the UMass Memorial Medical Center, and I'm an assistant professor of otolaryngology at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Um, and I am pleased to be able to speak with you today about uh, uh, otosclerosis as a condition and then stapedectomy um, as a treatment modality for that condition. I think as an otologist, um, otosclerosis and stapedectomy is, uh, a, or stapedectomy is a, um, one of the most prized um, uh, procedures that we performed. Uh, it's one of the most rewarding things that we do, but I think um, it also can be one of the most humbling procedures that we perform um, uh, given sometimes the complexity that we encounter. So I'm going to speak a little bit today about history of uh, otosclerosis and stapedectomy and stapy surgery, uh, and then go through some of the basics of primary stapedectomy and some of the complications that uh, one may encounter. So I don't have any conflicts or disclosures um, uh, for this. So otosclerosis is really a disease of altered bone metabolism and uh, it affects primarily um, the otic capsule. So uh, these are several low powered photomicrographs um, of uh, human otopathology that demonstrate the cochlea here, the internal auditory canal, the vestibule and the foot plate of the stapes, which you can see the curl arches of the stapes here. And uh, what uh, we know about otosclerosis is that it primarily affects the um, fenestra uh, around the anterior cruise of the stapes and ultimately will result in fixation of the stapedio-vestibular joint. Um, this is how it develops clinical manifestations of conductive hearing loss um, by blocking the sound conduction mechanism of the middle ear. Um, you can see in this photomicrograph that this patient has a relatively small area of fixation of the stapedio vestibular joint. So varying degrees of fixation lead to varying and progressive disease uh, degrees of conductive hearing loss. Um, Otosclerosis um, is a, a condition that used to be much more prevalent than it is today. Um, and part of that may have been due to a large backlog of cases uh, that were operated in the 1960s and 1970s. But we do know that um, at least um, uh, within certain populations, it is more prevalent still. Um, certainly Caucasians of Northern European descent um, have an incidence that's slightly greater than Asians. Uh, South Asians have a much higher incidence than East Asians, and people of African descent rarely have uh, otosclerosis. Um, uh, this uh, demographic uh, difference <clears throat> uh, is related to the large regional differences and incidence of disease. And um, there are some areas of the country that <clears throat> frequently see patients with otosclerosis in other parts of the country where it's much less common. <clears throat> Excuse me. Women are affected almost twice as much as men. And um, ultimately, uh, upwards of 80 to 90% of patients will go on to have a bilateral ear involvement. So what do we know about the history of otosclerosis? Uh, this is a photograph of Adam Pollitzer, who really is credited with discovering the condition. Um, prior to his research efforts in Vienna in the 1890s, stapes fixation was actually fairly well described. Um, but individuals thought that it was the consequence of a low-grade middle ear infection or inflammation and what they described as a dry catarrh or a plaque that would form between the bone of the uh, inner ear and the stapes, causing stapes fixation. But Pollitzer, uh, through detailed uh, histopathologic study in his laboratory, really was the first to describe this as a primary bone disorder of altered bone metabolism meaning that there was abnormal turnover of bone within the otic capsule, which is typically quite quiescent throughout life. And this increased bone turnover leads to stapes fixation. And he is the one who gave this the term uh, otosclerosis. This is a photograph of Pollitzer in his laboratory. I think what's remarkable about this picture is that you can really see uh, the limited uh, resources that he had uh, and the fairly rudimentary setup including gas lights uh, that were used with reflective mirrors in order to look into the ear of patients. Um, <clears throat> so from a clinical diagnostic standpoint, there 
uh, techniques and their uh, technology were relatively um, uh, primitive. Stapes surgery, though, um, goes back actually before the time of Pollitzer. And the man credited with uh, first uh, doing Stapes surgery was a gentleman by the name of Johannes Kessel. And in 1876, he performed a Stapes mobilization um, and noted that the patient had some improved hearing. Um, he did this by injecting cocaine through the uh, eustachian tube into the middle ear space, which seems somewhat barbaric. Uh, he then uh, he used illumination with a gaslight and a reflective mirror in order to look down the ear canal, made an incision in the tympanic membrane, and tried to mobilize the ossicular chain in a relatively blunt fashion. Um, as one can imagine, there were a number of complications associated with this, and he was widely condemned for this type of work. But in Boston, uh, in the late 1800s, um, two surgeons, one by the name of Frederick Drack and the other by the name of Clarence Blake, began performing surgery on the stapes by removing the entire stapes and allowing the tympanic membrane to fall down into the open oval window niche and, per, and ultimately heal in a type 4 tympanoplasty fashion. They found that the hearing was uh, improved and that hearing uh, improvement was durable in many of these patients. Uh, but they were also plagued by issues uh, similar to uh, Kessel in that many patients developed postoperative infections and developed meningitis. So in 1899, <clears throat> Adam Pulitzer and others in London at the International Otologic Conference really condemned all surgery on the stapes, saying that it was a fool's errand and that the risks did not outweigh the benefits. The second era of surgery for otosclerosis was really ushered in by uh, this gentleman, Julius Lempert, um, who, for those of you who are unfamiliar with him, was really a... Um, visionary in the world of otologic surgery. He was born in Russia, moved to New York City as a poor Russian immigrant, went to medical school in New York, but then was unable to obtain a residency. Um, uh, and so had to resort to uh, observing other ear surgeons uh, around New York City uh, over their shoulder. So he really, uh, through observation alone over the course of five to 10 years, was able to learn most of the basic procedures performed by otolaryngologists, and then ultimately went on to open up his own practice. He was very much a self-starter, and one of the things that he did was to send a message to all of the general practitioners in New York saying that if they referred to him, their uh, surgical patients, that he would return to those practitioners part of his surgical fee. This practice known as fee splitting is actually now illegal but it made Lempert very popular and very busy very quickly. Um, Lempert was also a, a very brilliant innovator and was interested in medical education and trying to not just improve techniques for his patients, but then also share those techniques with others. This is a video that Julius Lempert made of a septoplasty procedure using his uh, <clears throat> submucosal technique. And the um, technology for the 1920s that was implemented in this video is really quite remarkable. They used a cadaver, they used several layers of video in order to demonstrate um, both through cartoons and through uh, uh, cadaveric specimens, the way in which a submucous resection would be performed. And I think what's most remarkable is you see Lumpert there, uh, no mask, the patient awake, um, and uh, he's performing uh, this procedure in very uh, rapid fashion. But his ability to use uh, video and um, to clearly communicate his techniques are what made him uh, a very uh, popular and well-known all across the United States. And Lumpert was also known for being a very flashy guy. He had a tendency to smoke very expensive cigars. He had a monkey and a parrot in his waiting room. He had very expensive pieces of art in his examination rooms. Um, and so uh, he was known by uh, uh, many, many uh, folks within the otolaryngology community to be quite the character. But his big contribution to the field of otosclerosis was that he um, had the idea to bring uh, loop magnification and uh, the use of electric headlights into the operating room for ear surgery. 
Um, and he advocated the use for the very first time of a dental drill uh, in order to open up the mastoid. Prior to this, everyone was doing ear surgery with uh, hammer and chisel technique of Schwartz, which was described you know, more than 50 years before. And so uh, Lempert really brought uh, otology into the next generation by uh, implementing some, some basic uh, new technology. He also was a, uh, the, really the force behind end oral surgery where uh, incisions are made right at the level of the meatus as opposed to postericularly. And he described his dental drill and oral approach for cortical mastoidectomy uh, in a very elegant paper that was published in a step-by-step in a -step guide on how to perform that procedure. And this was really something that had never been done before um, in uh, the otologic community. People were very protective about their techniques, trying to protect their own practice. Uh, and Lumpert was a fan of trying to disseminate his knowledge to all. His end oral technique allowed him to be able to see directly down to the lateral semicircular canal. And through this approach and the work of these two gentlemen, uh, Gunnar Holmgren of Stockholm, Sweden, and Maurice Sordil of France, um, he was able to put together a single stage fenestration procedure for patients with otosclerosis. And what's most notable is that he uh, put together uh, this cohort of patients right around the time that antibiotics were being introduced. And antibiotics really were threatening to put all of the otolaryngologists out of business because everybody's practice was separative otitis media. And with the introduction of penicillin, there were many fewer cases of acute mastoiditis. And what Limpert's um, fenestration procedure ultimately did was to provide license to the otologist to be start performing surgery for the case of hearing improvement. This had never been done before. Um, so as you can see in this uh, illustration of Lempert's, um, this is an end oral incision. He has fenestrated the lateral semicircular canal, but left the stapes, which is down here within the oval window niche, completely untouched. And by rotating a soft tissue flap over the fenestration, he created a new window into the inner ear and was able to reestablish a sound pressure differential between his new fenestration and the round window. And that's what allowed a pressure differential across the basilar membrane and for hearing to be restored. And, and many of these patients, they would go from say a 70 dB conductive hearing loss up to say a 35 dB conductive hearing loss. Not perfect, but certainly much better. He published this um, back in 1938 in his uh, seminal work about um, uh, surgery for otosclerosis uh, and really set off a new wave of surgery and uh, surgical research on surgery for hearing improvement. We have uh, several specimens at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary um, of patients who underwent the fenestration operation. And in this low powered photomicrograph, you can see the patient's mastoid cavity um, and the lateral semicircular canal with the fenestration and the soft tissue graft directly over that. Uh, and this is open to the environment. Um, these patients certainly would have a bad caloric effect with cold wind or water in their ear, but the sound pressure was able to um, actually move the membrane over the lateral canal and provide a hearing improvement for patients with stapes fixation. As I mentioned, Lumpert was an instructor and he went on to teach uh, scores of other otologists um, in the methods of uh, fenestration surgery and safe and oral surgery. Um, but in 1953, a gentleman by the name of Sam Rosen um, described a series of stapes mobilizations. Um, he had been exploring an ear in a patient with hearing loss and had accidentally mobilized the stapes and the patient noted an immediate improvement in her hearing. So he went on to report this, um, these short-term outcomes um, and he was um, sort of credited with reestablishing surgery on the stapes for otosclerosis. Now, the reason why stapes mobilization is 
an ineffective long-term solution to uh, conductive hearing loss caused by otosclerosis is that although you can mobilize the anterior portion of the foot plate, as you see in this photomicrograph, this focus of otosclerosis may continue uh, to uh, develop and change over time. And typically the foot plate will refix and then the surgery um, will either need to be re uh, performed once again. So um, stapes mobilization when performed can be a short-term solution, but uh, it was recognized as not being a long-term one. Um, John Shea of the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary <clears throat> and later um, settled in Tennessee is really credited with um, reestablishing safe practices for stapedectomy. He would remove the entire stapes and then uh, in 1956 replace it with a Teflon stapes piston. Looks like this, the incus would go right through this little hole. And later he would reestablish, he would establish the um, total stapedectomy with a live tissue graft, typically a vein graft into the oval window with a Teflon prosthesis to connect the incus to the oval window. Uh, and uh, this technique uh, has undergone several small modifications since, but really remains the standard for our practice in stapes surgery today. Um, I think that the, the history of otosclerosis and the history of uh, the field of otology is fascinating. For anyone who's interested in reading or learning more about this, this book by Howard House for the world to hear is a really nice summary, not just of um, Dr. House's own life and his establishment of the House Ear Clinic in Los Angeles, but also of many of the central figures to the development of ear surgery today. There also is a nice online video. If you go to YouTube, John Shea has a history of the otosclerosis study group and history of stapes surgery, which is, which is really nice. So getting to the clinical matter um, uh, and the patients that we see in clinic that come in with conductive hearing loss, um, when you're taking a history in these patients, you really want to understand a few central things. So the first is that you want to know what the time course of the hearing loss has been. Uh, typically, patients with otosclerosis have a slow and progressive hearing loss. It may be bilateral, but not necessarily. And you want to make sure the patient doesn't have a history of trauma to the ear, temporal bone fracture, or ear infections. Um, you want to ask about surgical history and vestibular symptoms. Patients that have uh, vestibular uh, problems or Meniere's disease uh, in an ear that also has a conductive hearing loss should raise a lot of red flags. Those patients are typically poor surgical candidates. You also want to ask about a family history of hearing loss, given the genetic um, uh, tendency of uh, otosclerosis to run in families. When we perform physical exams in these patients, uh, otologic exam is key. You want to bring the patient under the microscope, perform binocular microscopy, you can really get a sense of the entire tympanic membrane, and also take an assessment of the size of the ear canal, the tortuosity of the ear canal, any exostoses, things that would make uh, eventual surgery more challenging. You can check the malleus's mobility with pneumatic insufflation, um, but most often the otologic exam is completely normal. We perform tuning fork exams because they help to confirm our audiometric diagnoses, but also can give us a sense about quantifying the degree of conductive hearing loss. In my practice, we use a flipped fork uh, uh, using the RINA test uh, at 512 as an indicator of surgical candidacy. So bone uh, louder than air at 512 would indicate a patient is uh, a good surgical candidate. What about the audiometric profile? Well, patients who have <coughs> otosclerosis typically have conductive hearing loss um, and they typically have normal tympanograms. Um, type A tympanograms, you want to make sure they don't have type B flat tympanograms with enlarged ear canal volume that may indicate a perforation or a flat tympanogram with uh, uh, a normal ear canal volume may indicate fluid. The acoustic reflex testing is a, a critical portion of the audiogram. You want to make sure that your audiologist has performed this. Acoustic reflexes are typically absent in otosclerosis, and that's because the patients have a middle ear origin of their conductive loss. The word recognition scores are typically quite good. Um, uh, so preserved word recognition with a conductive hearing loss, normal tympanogram, absent acoustic reflexes. Those are the things you wanna make, make sure you're seeing in patients. But sometimes patients come in with audiograms that look like this. They have a mixed loss. Um, and although this patient has a large conductive component, one thing that you really wanna make 
sure of is that um, if this patient goes on to undergo stapedectomy, they realize that their hearing may be significantly improved, but it's not going to be exactly the same as the left ear. Uh, mixed hearing losses and otosclerosis can occur because patients can have cochlear otosclerosis. So otosclerosis that involves more than just the um, uh, 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 the fistula antifenestrium, or this anterior portion of the uh, foot plate and the otic capsule, but uh, actually develop all around the periphery. Um, so in patients who have cochlear otosclerosis that get CT scans, you can frequently see what's called a halo sign around the cochlea. <clears throat> How does uh, cochlear otosclerosis cause hearing loss? Well, otopathologically, when we look at the cochlea of these patients, um, we can see that the spiral ligament, which is important for the metabolic health of the organ of cordy and the hair cells and neurons, um, is uh, atrophic. Uh, so this is a patient with cochlear otosclerosis, and you can see the spiral ligament has significantly decreased in size, and that may be because increased bone turnover directly adjacent to the spiral ligament uh, is leading to this loss. Um, and so these patients um, can undergo stapedectomy if their conductive loss is large, but they do need to be counseled about appropriate management um, of their sensory neural loss too, be that with um, uh, amplification or uh, perhaps with bisphosphonate treatment, um, which has been uh, recently described. Patients may come in uh, with an audiogram that looks like this. They've got a bilateral uh, conductive hearing loss, a somewhat mixed loss on the right, um, and a conductive loss on the left. And uh, in patients that have both ears involved, you wanna discuss with the patient which ear is the appropriate ear to begin with. Um, we typically will operate on the more severe uh, ear first, so the worst hearing ear, I'm trying to bring that up. And in this case, you can see this uh, patient's post-operative audiogram. Uh, the right ear is now her better hearing ear. She still has a conductive loss on the left, um, but uh, we want to wait until this uh, gets bigger. Um, and we also wait at least one year in between the right and the left sides. <clears throat> the reason for that is that patients can have um, failure or a, a loss of hearing or a new vestibular symptoms within that subacute uh, period. Sometimes patients ask, can you do both ears at the same time? The answer is always no. We do one ear at a time and we space that out by a year because that's typically the period of time that we would see something occur, say a prosthesis slip or um, some issue with the inner ear that would make us less likely to proceed with a contralateral procedure. But Seemingly, if everything goes okay, the patient's a candidate on the other side, certainly we can perform bilateral procedure. So what types of surgical considerations do we want to consider? Um, well, uh, typically a patient will have at least a 25 dB ear bone gap. Um, there really is no age limitation so long as the patient is uh, physically fit and able to tolerate anesthesia. But there are some absolute contraindications, including surgery in an only hearing ear uh, in any patient who would be permanently disabled by vestibular dysfunction in that operated ear. So someone who has a very uh, physical job um, and really relies upon their balance function greatly, you have to have a very serious conversation with them and you may recommend amplification. You also wanna be thoughtful about children, for instance, that have uh, stapes fixation, if that's congenital x leg stapes fixation um, uh, or uh, 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 early otosclerosis, um, uh, typically we wait until children are at least adolescents or adults before uh, involving them with a the conversation about the risks associated with a stapedectomy. If a patient has a hearing loss that is mixed and cor cor uh, correction of the conductive component does not obviate the need for a hearing aid, uh, then we may want to consider just amplifying that patient up front. Um, why go through surgery and the associated risks if they're still going to need a hearing aid? <clears throat> Um, when we do our informed consent and discuss with patients uh, the possibility of surgery, we always make sure that they understand that amplification is always an alternative, very low risk alternative for them. When we talk about the procedure itself, um, there are a number of risks that we really need to highlight and make sure the patient understands. First, a failure to achieve a hearing improvement, meaning a persistent conductive hearing loss, but also the development of a new hearing loss, including total deafness. Most individuals will quote a 1% chance of complete hearing loss in the operated ear. 
Um, patients may have some disequilibrium, immediate or delayed. I uh, have to talk about facial weakness, uh, perforation of the tympanic membrane, tinnitus, uh, and very important is to give patients an idea up front that they may have a change in taste, a metallic taste in their mouth um, uh, in the short term after the procedure. Um, now, uh, primary stapedectomy can be done a number of ways and is probably, um, uh, you know, um, going to be up to you to choose based on the type of training that you've had. Um, more recently, there have been a number of published series about endoscopic uh, stapedectomy. Uh, this is something that I trained doing uh, during my residency and fellowship, but um, I have chosen to continue to use the microscope. Microscope works great for stapedectomy. Uh, I use general anesthesia as opposed to local anesthesia. I find if I have trainees in the operating room, it's much easier in order to involve them. Um, and so you want to make some of these decisions, make sure you have the right equipment in the room and that you're um, prepared. When you position the patient, um, you want to choose if you're going to use a speculum holder or if you're going to hold the speculum with your hand. Uh, and then also consider a bolstering, uh, uh, using a headrest such as a Mayfield headrest or a shoulder roll in order to appropriately pay, uh, position the ear. Um, I always use nerve monitoring <clears throat> for stapes surgery. I use it for almost all of my ear surgeries. So you can see here some challenges in positioning. Uh, this is a patient uh, who has very poor neck extension, and sometimes this isn't apparent in the clinic. And so uh, assessing in the clinic the patient's degree of rotation of the neck, their extension, if they've been fused in their C-spine, it can make positioning quite challenging. This is a, a morbidly obese patient, and uh, stapes surgery can be incredibly challenging in these patients uh, just because the angle between the ear and the shoulder is uh, quite compromised. And so a lot of precautions, a lot of additional setup is important in order to be able to access the ear. Now, I have a number of illustrations that are compliments of Dr. Uh, Robert Jackler and Chris Grallup, who's an illustrator that works with him, really very, very nice illustrations that demonstrate the steps of stapedectomy and some of the pitfalls and challenges. And so I appreciate um, <clears throat> all of the hard work that went into uh, these images. Um, as you can see here, this is a, a speculum that's being uh, secured uh, with uh, the uh, middle and ring fingers as opposed to a speculum holder. I find this to be somewhat challenging, but primarily because I wasn't trained using this, I was trained using a speculum holder. But um, uh, make sure that you're comfortable with the equipment that you have prior to embarking upon stapedectomy. So I'll spend the next 10 to 15 minutes really going through how we get from this condition of uh, anterior focus of otosclerosis uh, right uh, over the anterior cruise of the stapes to a successful uh, stapedectomy uh, and um, uh, getting the prosthesis in position, uh, fenestrating the uh, oval window. All of these things are challenges of the procedure um, uh, that uh, we want to be thoughtful about how we approach. So once we have our setup <clears throat> and we're looking down the external auditory canal, we want to first design our flap. And it seems like a simple thing, but it is definitely uh, uh, an important component to uh, this case to make sure that your flap is of adequate size, but not too big. Uh, you can use a rose and knife in order to incise that flap in a circular pattern. Uh, I typically use a, a pizza cutter type knife. This is a roller knife, number one and number two, in order to make a square flap uh, and <clears throat> ensure that I make my way all the way through uh, the skin of the, of the bony ear canal. When we begin elevating uh, the tympanomiatal flap, we wanna make sure we're staying right on the bone, all the way down to the bone and keeping the flap intact, elevating it over a broad front. The Bellucci scissors can be helpful, particularly up superiorly where our vasculature is running uh, uh, through the external canal. Um, and uh, opening up this area can be somewhat of a challenge. You frequently have to reposition the microscope or even the speculum to be able to see. <clears throat> Keeping the knife on the bone of the ear canal is incredibly important because if we don't and it slips, 
then we can tear our flap. And this can be a problem. It can result in a mangled flap, or if you're very close to the tympanic membrane, you can actually perforate uh, the lateral marginal portion of the drum. So keeping the knife down, keeping it right on the bone, elevating and over a broad front, very important for raising the flap. Once we get the annulus up, you can see the thin veil of the uh, mucosa of the middle ear, and then this can be easily incised with a rosin needle. Um, and then a drum elevator or a gimmick elevator can be used underneath the annular rim uh, of the fibrous annulus in order to rotate down and open up the inferior aspect uh, of the mesotympanum. You can see the round window there. Once we have the flap lifted forward, you want to assess what your view is of the, uh, uh, of the stapes of the facial nerve. Um, I typically like to come somewhat higher than this diagram is uh, suggesting. Uh, I was always taught to raise your flap all the way up until you can see the malleus um, using a straight pick or a small joint knife in order to elevate it there. Once you can see the neck of the malleus, then you know you're going to have adequate exposure and that the flap's not going to be flopping back down onto you. Removal of the scutum is the next step, and we want to remove enough of this bone either with a micro drill, such as a skeeter drill or a dragonfly drill, um, or with a curette. Um, using a drill can be helpful in order to just thin this bone out and better define where your corda tympani nerve is going to be. Um, and then using a curette to then uh, fracture up the thin eggshell bone that remains behind <clears throat> is an effective way to do this safely. Curetting this bone can be a somewhat dangerous move, primarily because you're exerting a lot of force and you're very close to the uh, inner ear and the facial nerves. So you have to be very careful, make sure this is a controlled ice cream scoop type movement. Um, and once you begin to remove this bone, we can identify where the corda tympani nerve is, keeping that intact. And then we want to identify the landmarks that we need to see. So what do we need to see? How do we know when we're done curetting the sputum? Well, when we can see very clearly the tympanic segment of the facial nerve and the pyramidal process where the stapes tendon attaches. We have to see both of those landmarks very clearly in order to have the adequate space to get down to the foot plate. One of the things that had been suggested is that perhaps an endoscope could allow you to curette less. And I would, uh, having done a number of uh, endoscopic stapedectomies, <clears throat> I would argue that in fact, you still have to curette the same amount. And the reason why is that it's very challenging to get straight instruments like a laser or a micro drill or a, a measuring stick down into the foot plate area if this bone is still there. While you can see the stapes better with an angled endoscope or even a zero degree endoscope, it still is quite challenging to instrument the area without bone removal. So once we have exposed um, the ossicular chain and we can see the tympanic segment of the nerve and the pyramidal process, we want to do our assessment. And this assessment includes assessing the ossicular mobility. So all three of the ossicles assess the malleus, the incus, and then the stapes, and then describe where the focus of otosclerosis is. This is typically a whitish plaque or a hypervascular area, most often at the anterior foot plate. But if it's involving the otic capsule, it can be obliterative. We want to mark, remark upon the round window status. Is the round window open or is it obliterated? Um, if it's, uh, you want to uh, make note of that in your operative note, um, uh, which becomes relevant if perhaps you don't have a great outcome after the fact and you had an obliterated round window, then you want to uh, uh, make sure that that's an ear that you would not go back and explore. Um, the oval window you want to describe, is it a narrow niche, is there an overhanging facial nerve, and what's the status uh, of the foot plate? This is a photomicrograph of the incudomalleolar joint showing how the malleus can be fused to the epitympanic bone. This is a case of malleus fixation. And in a patient that had a uh, conductive hearing loss uh, on exploration, this is something that you would want to make note of if you did identify the malleus being fixated. If it was, then the procedure would be very different. You would need to nip the head of the malleus, probably remove the incus, and then place a partial ossicular replacement prosthesis if the stapes was mobile. 
these are several photomicrographs of the round window showing obliterative otosclerosis uh, 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 starting to encumber upon the round window. And these foci are not complete here, but in this case, there's complete obliteration. And a completely obliterated round window will result in a conductive hearing loss similar to the obliterated oval window. Once we have uh, our exposure, we want to use a measuring stick to understand the distance between the foot plate and the incus. Um, this is what's going to help us to choose the right uh, prosthesis. Um, most of the measuring sticks have a notch right around four millimeters. So if you have uh, an incus that's at four millimeters, then a 4.25 or a 4.5 prosthesis is uh, typically adequate. Um, sectioning of the incutostapedial joint uh, can then be performed, and we want to do this without traumatizing the stapes as much as possible. And this is um, an important time to remind everyone that the stapes is uh, secured via the stapedial tendon, and sectioning the joint should happen before cutting the tendon. And that is because it will help to stabilize the stapes. You want to move along the axis of the stapedial tendon to section the joint. This is a, in the weak direction. You can actually fracture the foot plate or mobilize the incus if you begin to move it superiorly and inferiorly. So uh, important to keep in mind when doing that um, disarticulation. The stapedial tendon can be cut with a Bellucci scissor or with a laser. Uh, and then the stapy superstructure can then be down fractured. This is a quick, rapid maneuver, uh, usually with a rosin needle or a joint knife where the stapes is uh, very quickly fractured down. You want to do that uh, so as not to try and mobilize the foot plate. Once we have the superstructure removed, we can then fenestrate uh, the foot plate, and this can be done with a micro drill, as is demonstrated here. Um, you want to make sure you know what the colors and sizes are of your micro drills. A green is a seven, uh, a 0.7 millimeter um, attachment for the Skeeter drill bit, but um, there are other brands of uh, micro drills that can be can be used. Um, uh, you also want to know what the size of your uh, uh, drill bit should be in relation to the prosthesis you're going to place. Typically, prostheses are 0.6 millimeters in diameter, but they can also be 0.5 if you have a narrow opening. Um, and you want to place that fenestration posterior to the equator of your uh, uh, foot plate. Uh, this helps because your trajectory from the incus down to this area is better and it's not at an angle. Once you have uh, fenestrated the foot plate, uh, sometimes there's a little bit of blood that's down in the area and it obscures your view. Keep in mind when you have the 24 suction on, which is the smallest suction, you want to have that uh, down next to the foot plate. Uh, if you're going to suction in the area, fingers should be off the hole uh, and you should never suction directly over the fenestration but adjacent to it so you do not suction up any perilymph that can cause a significant dizziness and hearing loss. Um, there are a number of different prostheses that can be used, uh, and uh, where I trained, we used the Shuknik prosthesis, because Hal Shuknik was our prior uh, chairman, and so this, uh, you know, the wire hook with Teflon piston um, is uh, most commonly used today. <clears throat> when you place the prosthesis, this is a delicate maneuver, but you want to make sure the prosthesis gets through your fenestration and over the incus, and before you go about crimping, you should check the mobility because that's really your opportunity to change the position, change the size of the prosthesis, make sure that it's stable within the fenestration. And then once that has been performed, you can then go about crimping the prosthesis. And this uh, traditionally was done with a crimping instrument wherein uh, you engage the posterior aspect of the wire and then gently descend the anterior portion of the wire to securely um, fix the prosthesis to the incus. Um, uh, although nowadays many of us use a nitinol style prosthesis. One thing I would say about this image is that the, um, <clears throat> the uh, crimping instrument uh, is blocking our view completely of the prosthesis. And you really want to make sure it's coming in from the side so you can see where the prosthesis is and do a, a, your crimp, a crimp um, uh, maneuver under full visualization so you don't um, pull the prosthesis out of the vestibule. A nitinol prosthesis is great. This is actually what I use nowadays. Um, it provides a very firm um, uh, uh, crimp to the incus. Um, one thing you do have to be careful of is you want to reduce your um, laser settings in order to make sure that you're not um, 
uh, cauterizing and weakening your distal incus. <clears throat> you can use a laser as opposed to um, uh, just a Bellucci scissor and a, a micro drill to perform stapedectomy. Uh, the, you want to make sure you understand um, what the laser safety uh, settings are. So all each laser is a little bit different. So if it's a KTP or a CO2 laser, there are different precautions that are necessary. So if you're starting out in practice and you're going to start doing stapedectomies, you want to make sure you understand one, what the safety protocols are for the laser in the operating room and two, what the specific settings are that you want when you perform the procedure and writing these things down from your uh, residency program and your otologist that performs stapedectomy is a great idea to make sure that you're equipped when you go out to be well informed. You can cauterize the posterior crews with the laser. This is the technique that I use because then it only um, necessitates fracturing the anterior crews uh, uh, when you're removing the remainder of the stapy superstructure. A little bit safer, I think, and less likely that you sublux the foot plate. Um, and that's the maneuver there. <clears throat> um, afterwards, as opposed to using a micro drill, you can use a laser to fenestrate the foot plate. Typically, these settings are different than the settings that you would use for sectioning the tendon in the posterior cruise. Um, you don't want to evaporate all of your perilymph on an overly hot laser setting. Um, but you make a rosette of laser marks and then use a straight pick or a curved pick in order to um, open up uh, your fenestration. And then very importantly, you want to make sure you're familiar with your oval window rasp and using a rasp that's about 0.6 millimeters. This is the same size as your prosthesis. Ensure that it fits through the fenestration. Um, and sometimes there are little bony chips around the edges that you need to fracture with this a very delicate maneuver, but you want to make sure that you have an adequate size fenestration to permit your prosthesis to enter and not to chafe on the side of the bone. And uh, that would result in a persistent conductive hearing loss. If in the process of fenestrating the uh, foot plate, a fragment falls into the vestibule, it is a no-no to put your uh, hook in and try and pull this back out. You are liable to capture the uh, utricle or the saccule in the process, um, which could result in significant um, dizziness and hearing loss. Um, so if a, if a piece of the foot plate falls in, typically we leave that or try and manipulate it using the parts of the foot plate that are still um, outside of the vestibule. Keep in mind that a laser um, can overheat the foot plate, particularly if there is a lack of pigment. If it's bright white and you're hitting the laser many times in the area, it can get quite hot. And that can have implications if you have a dehiscent facial nerve. You can reflect that laser um, uh, into the nerve and cause damage. So you need to be very careful, very aware of that. It certainly has been reported. So in the next few minutes, I'll go through a few complications in stapedectomy <clears throat> and how to avoid them. Uh, and then I wanna leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, when we put our tympanomiatal flap back, if it doesn't get completely unfurled, you can develop a keratin pearl. That's why it's important to see patients after surgery, look in their ear canal, make sure that their ear canal is healthy. If you see one of these and it's early, it's not a big deal. Just get a cerumen loop and you can marsupialize it. And usually that takes care of the problem. During the procedure, you want to make sure you avoid this complication by unfurling the flap edge completely. You can do that with a joint knife or with a, um, a drum elevator and your suction. <clears throat> if uh, perhaps you uh, uh, create a perforation in the tympanic membrane at the time of elevating your flap, um, uh, the important thing is that you recognize it at the time of the procedure and you fix it. Um, these are traumatic perforations. They heal extremely well, but you do have to just take the time, harvest a little perichondrium or a little fascia or use an uh, uh, off-the-shelf material and graft the drum. It takes uh, an extra five minutes, um, but will avoid a lot of headaches down the road. Um, if your flap is a little bit too short or you had to curette quite a bit of bone and you have a, uh, a dehiscent um, flap edge that does not completely come all the way back uh, onto the ear canal bone, again, take the time, get a little bit of fascia or perichondrium and just graft that area. This will heal nicely, but you have to recognize it and pay attention to it at the time of surgery. 
Um, sometimes the scutum beneath the corda tympani nerve can be quite uh, prominent and can be right in the way of your instruments getting into the oval window. Removing this bone is important. Um, I typically use a very small stapes curette in order to just gently um, move the corda tympani aside and then curette out this bone. But you want to address this and you want to try and do so without damaging the corda. I find it ch somewhat challenging to use a drill in this area and frequently the drill can overheat the nerve and cause uh, dyscusia postoperatively. Otosclerosis is most often an anterior focus of otosclerosis, but it can also be obliterative or can have a biscuit type uh, appearance to it. And these two conditions can be quite challenging to address and to, uh, uh, to uh, fenestrate uh, the uh, vestibule. You need to use a drill, uh, typically a micro drill, in order to saucerize the area until you get down to a very, very thin uh, portion of the foot plate. Uh, once you see a small um, uh, indication of perilymph, uh, you want to make sure that you're, uh, you've adequately saucerized so that your prosthesis is not going down a narrow tunnel, um, but is going to be able to uh, freely move in and out of the foot plate. Um, in a biscuit type fashion, you need to um, separate the foot plate in the middle and then typically remove a posterior portion of it. These are rarely encountered conditions, but uh, recognize that um, we need to be aware of them if we do uh, encounter that. Um, sometimes the niche is quite narrow because of an overhanging uh, promontory scroll, uh, and it's uh, perfectly reasonable to remove this with a micro drill in order to open up the oval window. So it's incumbent upon the surgeon is to recognize things don't look totally right. Why is it that things don't look right? And then try and address the issue so that you make the procedure as straightforward and as easy for yourself as possible. A dehiscent facial nerve can be a scary finding. If you see one that is so dehiscent like this that it's completely smashing the uh, stapes up against the uh, cochlear promontory, totally reasonable to stop, put the flap back down and offer amplification to that patient. One of the questions becomes is the conductive hearing loss is due to um, an impedance of the facial nerve or true otosclerosis. Sometimes it may be a combination of both. If you have a small amount of dehiscence of the nerve and still have available oval window that you can fenestrate, you need to be thoughtful about how you put in your stapes piston. Uh, there are a number of off-the-shelf offset pistons now that you can position um, that can allow you to avoid irritating the nerve with the prosthesis, which is something that you don't want to do. You can also use an offset bucket handle and do a total stapedectomy if, if need be. As I mentioned before, Meniere's disease and otosclerosis may occur in the same ear. If that's the case, this is not a patient that you want to operate on. As you can imagine, a dilated endolymphatic space with a dilated utricle and saccule can lead to major problems. If you fenestrate the foot plate, your prosthesis can impinge upon the saccule, can cause a persistent dizziness, and in many cases can result in profound sensory neural hearing loss. So a patient that has vestibular symptoms and otosclerosis is someone who you want to perhaps uh, choose to amplify. Um, <clears throat> if you have a CSF gusher at the time of the procedure, um, after you fenestrate the foot plate, this can also be a, a somewhat nerve wracking condition. Um, you may need to drain off a certain amount of CSF by putting the patient in a Trendelenburg position um, and then uh, trying to complete the procedure. It's also quite reasonable to stop, put in a soft tissue graft, have the patient get a lumbar drain in the operating room, put the tympanomiatal flap back, and then um, uh, make sure things heal uh, while the lumbar drain is in place, diverting CSF for a period of time uh, before um, uh, uh, discharging the patient and, and making sure that that oval window is completely sealed. Um, these are great patients for amplification. Again, uh, this is a quite uh, challenging uh, scenario to, uh, to proceed upon. I think uh, given the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and stop there um, and I can go to any questions. Um, and I just have to say, uh, I want to acknowledge my mentor, Dr. Mike McKenna, one of the foremost thought leaders in otosclerosis. He's the one that taught me quite a bit about uh, operating on uh, patients with otosclerosis and uh, management of complicated stapes cases. But with that, I will go to um, questions.